Wow, you're really tall. How tall are you? Did you play basketball? You played in the NBA with LeBron James? What was that like? It was fun. We got along well. <laughs> LeBron, the inner city kid from Ohio, and me, the deaf polygamous kid from Montana. <laughs> What? You grew up in polygamy? What was that like? I don't get it. Why would people do that? Why would they stay? I can never be a second or a third wife. Not that complicated, really. It's what they know. It's the world they grew up in, and they know what the boundaries and the rules are, and they're told to stay inside those boundaries, the physical boundaries of the commune, and furthermore, the mental and emotional boundaries. Stay inside those boundaries, and you will always be safe. Safe from pain. Most people will choose a familiar hell over an unfamiliar heaven. So now I ask you: What is your polygamy? What are the thought patterns you have inherited from your childhood, from your parents, your grandparents, your community, that you've taken with you into your adult life? What are the stories and perceived truths that still linger? That are maybe sabotaging your adult experience. What are the boundaries and comfort zones you have settled in, never daring to take risk? Physically escaping from polygamy at the age of 13 for me was the easy part. Mentally and emotionally escaping, far different story. My grandfather was Rulon Allred, the prophet and founder of the Apostolic United Brethren. I never knew him, as he was assassinated four years before I was born by the wife of a rival polygamous leader. But I was raised in his utopian dream of Pinesdale, Montana. My childhood was a world of wonder and mysticism, solidified by black and white absolutes, absolutes that said that we were special, that we were God's chosen people, that we had the one true church. With a capital T, and that my grandfather was up in heaven, waiting for me. The nature and appeal of absolutes is that they provide certainty in an uncertain world, and most people will do anything, anything they can, to protect that. Could you become a god? Yes. How far would you be willing to go to defend the principle of polygamy? I was raised for it. I was I was born for it, reared for it, trained for it all my life. Would you die for it? I would die for it. We are trying to keep all the commandments of God. Early this morning, Rulon Allred, fundamentalist leader of the Apostolic United Brethren, was found shot dead in his medical office. Witnesses noticed two unidentified females leaving the scene. So again, I ask you, what is your polygamy? What are the black and white absolutes that you hold on to that allow you to believe that you have the truth, that you're right? And what relationships would you sabotage or endure to hold on to that story? Maybe you're an expert mental gymnast like myself. You had to be growing up in that world of pesky absolutes. On one hand, you are so special. Yet, on the other, you're not quite worthy. You could do better. <laughs> you are loved unconditionally, without question, on the condition you do everything the prophet says. And when you speak at the prophet, you speak very softly, like this. You are told that lying is a sin. Yet, if anyone asks you if your dad is a polygamist, you have to lie. What are the mental gymnastics you pull to stay within your paradigm, to avoid cutting your losses? Would you like to see a polygamous wedding? Jazz hands. <laughs> This is my mother, the age of 16, being placed in an arranged marriage with my father. Now, note: these are not bridesmaids. 
These are my mom's sister moms. Those are my dad's. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's just a lot of women in that room. Throughout my basketball career, I'd have teammates come up to me and say, "Hey, yo, dog, this new club be hoppin'. There's like three girls to one guy ratio. We gotta go check it." And I'm like, "I'm good." As a boy growing up in polygamy, you saw men in power, the prophets, with multiple wives, and so you began telling yourself the story that a woman is how God validates you. More wives equals more worthy equals more power equals more blessings equals more wives, and so on and so on. And you're also told that women don't need the priesthood because they're already so spiritual. And so, as a boy, I began putting women on pedestals, believing that they were inherently better than me. That they somehow had X-ray vision and could see right through me and determine if I was worthy or not. A dialogue went like this one day with my cousin when I was 12 years old. Stephen Don, and it's it's proper etiquette to use middle names when you have 400 first cousins running around the wilderness like Smurfs. Stephen Don, I think I like Lisa. Do you think she might like me back? No, I already claimed her. I called dibs. But you called dibs on Sarah last week. Yeah, so we're polygamists. Oh, can you imagine how competitive that world might be? Polygamy. Now, once a girl began to mature, not only did you like her, but your brothers liked her, your cousins, your uncles. Heck, even your dad theoretically is your competition, and you're all playing for keeps, because the founders of the Mormon faith did declare you need at least two wives to get to the highest degree of glory in heaven. My fear and anxiety around girls was only exacerbated by how difficult it was for me to hear them as they speak on a higher register, and I was also very self-conscious about how I talked. And I know you don't really hear it now, but I was in speech therapy until I was 15 years old. I'm going to show you a video of me speaking at the age of 11. Mind you, I've been in speech therapy for nine years up to this point. Yeah, I was goalie for the, my soccer team. In- Now the plots can be basketball and stuff, and I got a floor burn right here. Wow. And I was scared. Man. I opened up my present, and that actually all we did when we went to the Nintendo game. <laughs> and we went to Microsoft Pet Store, but nothing. I've watched this video over 300 times, and I still have no idea what the hell I'm saying. The greatest challenge of a disability is not the actual disability itself, but rather the perceived limitations that everyone around you and eventually yourself begin to believe are true. Maybe that is your polygamy, or like me, it was impressed upon you as a five-year-old boy by your Sunday school teacher that God had made you deaf as a form of punishment, that you had done something wrong in the pre-life. And so, for as long as you can remember, really, you always believed you had to earn God's love. Well, after I escaped polygamy for years, I believed deep down, somewhere in here, that I had to be the first deaf player in NBA history, and then God would be proud of me. And then I'd be worthy of His love, and not only His love, but the love of a woman as well. This was my polygamy. For years, all throughout my twenties, I avoided relationships, sabotaged them, and my first real relationship occurred when I turned thirty, and that would turn into a marriage. And can you imagine the baggage I brought into it? But I choose clarity now. I choose to shine a light on the mental prison that is my polygamy. If I do not, then I will have lost my marriage for nothing.
I choose clarity. I choose to empower myself with the accountability of choice. We spend our lives giving away our power by how we speak. I have to go pick up my kids from school. I need to turn in my quarterly reports. What if, what if we began speaking like this? I choose to go pick up my kids from school. I choose to turn in my quarterly reports tomorrow. I choose not to color coordinate family photos this year. Mom, sorry. <laughs> this is far more difficult than it sounds when you try it because we have been so conditioned to give away our will and our choice by how we speak. I have to, I need to, I want to, I could, I should. I choose. I choose to empower myself with the accountability of choice. I choose to ask myself with each thought, is this Lance thinking or is it my polygamous thought patterns thinking? Thought patterns that no longer serve me. I choose to no longer be a martyr like my grandfather. I choose the clarity that it is mental gymnastics to believe that my self-worth is ever in question. I choose the clarity that love is either unconditional or it is not love at all. I choose to be a leader of my own life. I choose. It is my choice. It has always been my choice just as it has always been your choice. This is how you escape your polygamy. Empower yourself with the accountability of choice. Be a leader of your own life. And now, as I say goodbye, on behalf of a five-year-old boy from rural Montana who could not hear nor speak very well, who spent thousands of hours in speech therapy practicing and practicing with the hope that one day he might, just might, become one of the greatest communicators in the world. On behalf of that five-year-old boy, thank you for allowing him to be heard.